19 through 20. And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Good morning. morning. Is there any doubt that we're supposed to go make disciples of all the nations? No doubt. No doubt that that's what we are supposed to be about. We have been supporting several works through the years, but right now we have been supporting Jean Terard Elmera with the Delmas Church in Port-au-Prince for, I think, well, since 96. I believe that's when we started. At any rate... uh, Nick and Christy's class. Nick's our son-in-law, Christy's our daughter, and they worship with the Edmund Church of Christ. And the Edmund Church sends out groups on a regular basis to do mission works and to support works that they're involved in. They chose their Bible class, young adult Bible class, chose to go to Haiti and work with the Hope for Haiti's Children work that's going on down there. This is our group. There were 18 of us total. Four of their group that had originally signed on had to drop out. So they had four slots, and they had money down on those slots. And so Christy called and said, hey, you guys want to go? So we said, yeah, we'll go. It's like $250 a head. Who wouldn't jump in for $250 a head? Of course, they took more than our heads down there. But they, anyway, we, we went to Haiti. And, and we thought, what a great opportunity to go to Haiti and be involved in mission work and to, to see what's going on with Jean Terard that we've been supporting. So it, it really worked well for both congregations. This is us. This is a picture we took out in the countryside when our bus was stuck in the mud. Uh, but that's the story we'll get to in a little while. This was right at the airport. This is one of the worst experiences I think we had when we were there. We got off the plane and we were, we were uh, descended upon by about 50 guys who all wanted to take our bags for money. And this was, uh, we call him the luggage Nazi. Anyway, he, was, he, was, he practically pulled my hands off the cart, and I was pushing my own stuff. I wanted to, anyway, give him a good Christian greeting. Uh, this was our bus. We got to the airport, and they had transportation for us, but this was it. It's like a bread truck, two little vents in the front. That's looking out the back. And this was what we rode uh, two hours in from the airport to the church at uh, Thomas, but we didn't go to Thomas, uh, Thomas O first. We were heading on to Cazo. Three orphanages we visited. The one at Cazo that's in Port-au-Prince. Then about two hours away is Thomaso, where we stayed and worked for the week. And then we came back to Port-au-Prince on, on Friday and visited uh, what's called City Soleil, the poorest slum in the Western Hemisphere. And there's a church and an orphanage down there. This is the traffic. This is what it looks like out the back of that bread truck as we're driving along. And it's, it's tight. This doesn't nearly tell the picture, but I wanted you to see a little bit of the traffic. You see these things all over. They're called tap-taps. This is a Haitian cab. If you get close enough to it, you can tap-tap on it. And he'll stop. You jump in, tap-tap, and he takes off. And tap-tap when you want to get off. So I guess that guy here is tap-taps all day long. But these are just old pickups. And you can tell if you can see the back end of it, it's really weighted down. That's because it is filled with people. They put benches inside. They get old campers or whatever, plywood, whatever they can build with. They paint the whole thing up. They even paint the windshield. And uh, they drive down the road and make a little money. Here's another big tap-tap. You can see the throngs of people getting in that. And over here on the, uh, to, to your right, you see the guy with the thing on his head? He is a water vendor. He's got plastic baggies of water inside that thing and he'll reach up there and grab one, hand it to you and you give him a coin. He goes up to the cars as you're stuck in traffic and sells water to everybody who wants it. Here's some of the earthquake damage. You know, there was a huge earthquake down there in 2010 and they're still recovering from that. The roads are still recovering from that too in Port Au-Prince. They are in horrible shape. Worse than gravel roads in a lot of places. This is a picture of what you'll see in Port Au Prince and all over the place. This is a subdivision. This is where people live. This is their housing. Another picture of, uh, of a, a subdivision. I, I call it a subdivision for lack of a better term. It's their equivalent for us. This is what you see all over the place. There's another water vendor, of course, with the stuff on his head, but but you see trash all over the place. It's like the government has broken down and they just don't have the means to go out and collect this stuff and clean things up, so there's trash all over the place. This is the main gate of the Cazo Children's Home or the Cazo Orphanage, which is a work of the Lord's Church of uh, Hope for Haiti's Children. They're in Port Au Prince. And as we came in, we looked back. This is what the gate looks like from inside, and you can see in the background there uh, how much city there is. They're right in the middle of of Port Au Prince. 
Here's us being greeted by the children in this particular orphanage. At the Kazoo Orphanage, there are, I think, 72 to 78 children. I don't remember the exact number. But they were there waiting for us, and they greeted us warmly. They sang for us, and they were just clinging to us and holding on to us and playing games and having all kinds of good time. They liked the girls' straight hair. They had the girls sit down, and they immediately began braiding and plaiting their hair. And I think they sat there for like an hour and a half while the kids just played with their hair. The, I don't know who had more fun doing that. This is inside the church building that also doubles as a school building there at Kazo, because they not only keep these children, they educate them right there. And I believe they bring in some children from the neighborhood, and they go to school there as well. But this is where the church meets and worships at Kazo. This is where the children who are living in the orphanage also have school and their, their worship. I'm doing this fast and talking fast because i got a lot of pictures. This is the playground outside the orphanage. Right now it's serving as a parking lot, and they had some beds that they pulled out to paint the frames. But you can see the boys playing soccer. A lot of our guys played soccer, and they just the kids ate that up, having all these big white guys to play soccer with them. It was fun. There's Ken. This is Ken Beaver. Now, Ron Beaver, his dad, has been here not too long ago and spoken for us. This is his son, Ken. Ken is the one who uh, initiated, who got established the work, uh, Hope for Haiti's Children. And this guy next to him is Jean-Baptiste. You thought you'd never see a picture of what Jean the Baptist looked like. Well, there he is, Jean-Baptiste right there. Jean-Baptiste is a local preacher. He does a very good work. He and his family have been stalwart in uh, the work there in Haiti for years. He also did some translating for us during Bible classes. This is Matt Typical uh, day with the kids at the orphanage. They like to play all kinds of games and touch. You can see another kid's got him by the arm over here. When you go in, they, they just come to you and they're just starved for attention. They're well taken care of. They're clean and well fed. They're healthy, but they long for attention. You can imagine if you've got 70 some kids to care for, you can't give too much individual attention. Debbie sat down with a bunch of the girls and they learned games like uh, one potato, two potato, if you know how to play that, or duck, duck, goose. If you don't know how to play that, Debbie will give a demonstration in the foyer right after the lesson this morning. But this, this was great fun. This is a picture inside what we would call their cafeteria. This is the room they ate in. And here is a delicious meal cooking on the stove. This was corn porridge is how it was described to us. It's just corn that's cooked up and some other ingredients are added to it. And the children are fed this. And we might look at that and think, oh my goodness, that's horrible. Hey, these kids are eating. They have food. We have no idea what the circumstances are like in Haiti until we get down there and we see that people are poor. There are people, literally, you see those, those trash heaps? People are scrounging through there to find whatever they can to make their lives a little better. So these kids are eating well. They're being educated. This is one of the classrooms. And as you can see, it's, it's rather sparse. There's not a whole lot there. It's not just that there is not a whole lot of money to buy things in Haiti. There's not a whole lot to buy in Haiti. It's just a very poor country, and people have to make do as best they can. This is one of the uh, sleeping rooms, bedrooms, for some of the kids there in Haiti. It's kind of plain, but it's secure. They're inside a, an interior wall. They're inside a building. Those doors are secured at night so that nobody can bother them, and they've got a good, clean place to sleep that's secure. It means a lot. This is what it was like the whole time. Anywhere, anytime you're around the kids, they're, you're coming to you and hanging on because they just love that kind of attention. This is us leaving Kazo. This is some of them got out of the bread truck and got in this truck to ride in the back of it. And uh, the hat stayed with us most of the time. I think Kevin, Kevin's here. He had his the whole time and then lost it just before we got to the airport. Blew off on, on the highway. These kinds of trees were all over the place. This is not a very good picture of one of these trees, but I guess it's about the best one we had. But these trees were all over it. You see those orange flowers? They're blooming all over the place. It's, it's the tropics. Tropical flowers and plants grow all over. Here's another picture of some of the very colorful. Of course, the picture doesn't do them justice, the flowers that were growing. Uh, Debbie said, you've got to put those pictures in there. The ladies are going to want to see some pretty stuff after seeing all the, the poverty. Here's a little kind of like an oasis along the road. It was a place where there was a fresh spring and they built a little wall around it to make a swimming hole and people could go down there and have a little recreation. This is what you see. Now, one thing, you'll get an idea what the roads were like. This is what we were on for almost two hours, these kind of gravel roads. But this is a very good stretch of the road. 
Uh, there were places much worse than this. And I don't know if you can see it or not, but those goats are wearing yokes. They put these, they take a fork stick and put it on the top of the goat's neck and then across the two bottom pieces, they'll put a larger stick, a longer stick, so that it can't get through the small openings to go through fences and into homes and things like that. And the goats just roam all over the place. There were goats everywhere you looked. This is a store. This is a business. Uh, I don't think anybody was in attendance there right now, but these white things are just old refrigerating units that have been turned over and they put their goods in there and they uh, get ice in town and put that ice on top of those things to cool them in the beginning of the day and then whatever they sell is, is gone. But that's, that's what a business looks like in Haiti. This is another business. This is a wood shop. You can see the guys under the, uh, the shaded places creating some kind of furniture, probably some shelving there. If you like fine dining, there's plenty of that in Haiti. Uh, if you want an anniversary dinner to take your wife to, this is the place right there, the Miami restaurant. I don't know what 100% blot is, but it's probably really good. Here's a home. This is one of the typical homes. We wanted to show you this one because you can see in the foreground some green bushes. Those are cactus. And these cactus are, are grown along the perimeters of people's property to protect from zombies. Because there is a strong belief in uh, spirits and zombies and the lugaru, the shape-shifting werewolf type creatures. There's all kinds of beliefs down there that we might go, wow, what's, why do people believe in those things? Well, they do. And so they put these cactus fences up to keep the zombies out. This is a picture of the land side, or landscape, the countryside right there around the Tomaso Orphanage. Because we've driven out of Port-au-Prince now, about two hours out. Now, on American roads, it'd probably be about 20 minutes. But Haitian roads, it's about two hours. And so you picture, we're in the back of this bread truck, riding like this for two hours. And so, so that's, that's how we get out to Tomaso, riding like that. This is uh, the main gate around the perimeter, because they have to have a fence and a main gate to keep everything secured. We go through this gate, and then we're driving up. Uh, well, we get through that gate, and adjacent to this gate, this is the school at Tomaso. This is where the kids go to school. This also doubles as the church building. The church at Tomaso meets in this building. There's about four rooms to that. It doesn't look like much, but it serves them very well. And then you, you go past that on up the road. You can see the big house up there in the uh, background. And this little house on the side, that's the, uh, the Johnny house for the schoolhouse. So you have a place to go to the bathroom. Although most of the little Haitian boys, well, Haitian girls too, they didn't use that. They just went outside and found a place and just went. It's, it's just part of the way they do things. This is the second gate that you get to. You notice the stone wall, and on top of that wall is a Constantina wire. If you own anything, you have to put a wall around it, and you have to put Constantina wire or something around it because you, you have to keep it secure. There's so much poverty, so much desperation that this is just the way you have to live. That blue thing there next to the truck is the big steel gate that's on rollers, and it rolls to the side, and you go in, and it, it rolls back. You keep everything secure. This is a better picture of the big house. Very nice. They want to expand this. This house is actually used mostly to house people like us who came there to work. There are other buildings that are very nice where the, uh, the orphans stay and where the, the folks who manage the place stay. This little tower is the guard tower. Not only do they have to put a wall around everything, but here they established a guard tower. And This is Mizo. He's sitting there reading his Bible. He comes at 6 o'clock every night and stays until 6 in the morning. So he's there all night to make sure everything stays secure. This is what it looks like also inside the compound. You can see the guard tower up in the top there. But they've got gardens planted. They're trying to be as self-sufficient as possible, raising all kinds of fruits and vegetables for the kids. They've got eggplant, peppers, uh, what are the fruit hanging off the tree? Mangoes, egg, did I say eggplant? A lot of eggplant. All kinds of good things growing there. We planted squash while we were there, but it's a, it's a very nice place. This is a little kind of an oasis section of it, and the kids were playing with kites that uh, the, the folks from Edmond brought for the kids to play with. They loved that kind of stuff. But you can see that a lot of work's been done there to get this place established. It's only been there since 2010. Now, this is what you look like when you get off of the truck. This is, uh, this is Nathan. He went with us on the trip, and that's Jared next to him. Jared's been leading our singing this morning. Jared's in the sunglasses. But you sit in the back of that bread truck, and you're right on these dirt gravel roads doing this for a couple of hours. You get a little dusty. It was kind of funny. 
uh, Nathan had dust in his mouth. And so at one point along the road, he spat out the back. Well, it, the timing was just perfectly wrong because just as he spat, there was a guy that stepped back out into the road and, it, and that spit hit him and he was, oh, what's going on? I didn't know at first what was happening. I thought he was just trying to, hey, uh, you bunch of Americans. And he said, no, I'm going to come get you guys because you <laughs> spit on me out of the back of this truck. Well, what do you do? This is what happens when you get around the orphans. They, wanna, they want you to pick them up and you pick them up and you hold them. And they ride on your shoulders. They just get all kinds of good attention from you because they're starved for it. They're wonderful little kids and a pleasure to be around. But they're, they're just kids. This is Kevin with a, a little friend he made over there. There's Nathan again. Nope, nobody's posing for these shots. This is just what it looked like all the time. You get up in the morning, you go outside, and here are the young people from Edmond with kids hanging all over. It was great. They also like to play games. This is, uh, <coughs> excuse me, they're, they're playing the game speed where you put your hands like this and you try to slap the hand on top of you or you're on top and they're trying to slap you and whoever can pull away first wins. Simple little games like that they love because they, they don't have any toys like we have toys, all kinds of electronic games. This I was mentioning a while ago, the quarters where the orphans slept. Very nice concrete pad for them to play on out there. Very nice, secure, solid buildings. This is a view inside one of those rooms with the bunk beds. There's not much to it, but this is palatial compared to what the community has around. This is their shower. It's more or less outdoors, and there's a tub there. They fill that tub full of water and get in there and take a bath. The little ones do. And here's a view from up top looking down on that shower. You can see those naked little kids running around down there because they go out in the mornings and they, they get naked and they take their baths and then they put their clothes back on. Now here in Oklahoma, the DHS might frown on that. But this ain't Oklahoma. This is Haiti. And they have a different view of things like that. And, and there's, there's nothing wrong with it. These are just kids getting clean. And that's another thing I noticed. Everywhere we went, it seemed like everybody was clean. They were poor, but they were clean. I really thought, oh, I've never been to Haiti. Probably going to be a bunch of stinky people down there. I did not run into the first stinky person in Haiti. It was, it was uh, an eye-opening thing for me. This is little, I think her name is Angel. They've, uh, they've had their baths. They filled that thing with water. Now they're all brushing their teeth. This is them gathering for breakfast. And these are their school uniforms. All of these orphans that stay in the homes are supported by somebody in another country who sends money. And that money provides school uniforms and pays for their food, whatever materials they're able to get to provide them with education. That's what those funds are for. And anybody here who wants to can help support an orphan in that fashion. This is Anthony and his wife and little girl. There are some of the caretakers there. Always busy doing something to keep that place going. This is our group in the big room inside the big house. This is where we met for our meals. It's also where we had a couple of devotionals. We'd normally go up on the roof, but there were a couple of evenings when it rained, and so we met down here. That's where we had our, our devotionals. This is one of the places where we found out what a good song leader Jared was. These are, uh, this is a typical meal. Over in the pot that's to your left is goat. Anybody ever eat goat? Probably somebody's got your goat from time to time. Maybe you got somebody else's goat. But, but this is a goat that uh, was cut up and served to us. In the second dish next to that, those are fried plantains, and they're excellent. It's really good food. And then you've got, <coughs> excuse me, I think this is the potato salad. I'm not sure exactly what that was. And then over on the far right, you've got, oh, no, your left. Get my directions down here. Over here is, yeah, over there is this stuff called pickling, I think it was. And it's like coleslaw, but it's spicy. Really good. They fit us great down there. We actually kind of felt bad eating all this good food when there were so many people that didn't have it outside. This is a dish of rice and beans. And uh, I think this was the evening we had goat. And those, those shiny looking yellow things are also dumplings. Really good. Great food. This young man brought us a goat. He had been helped through the orphanage and through the work there of Hope for Haiti's children with his education. And so to thank Ken and the uh, folks working at the orphanage, he brought us a goat one day. We, we didn't know too much about it. We were sitting out visiting and we heard somebody uh, with a goat downstairs. And then the goat started. And, it, and, it, and the goat was taken care of, being provided for our supper. 
And this is the young man that brought the goat, and we're taking a picture of him as we enjoy this goat meal together. It was excellent. They also wanted to provide us Americans with something a little special, so they brought in Cokes every night. And we had Cokes, we had uh, Haitian limonades. This is a lady delivering plantains. This is how a lot of things are carried down there. You got this cloth. I meant to get the name of what that cloth is, but it's a stiff cloth that you curl up on your head, and you put your burdens up there, and you just walk with your burden up there. That's what she does, and that's what they all do. If you get exhausted, you take a nap. This is one of our young ladies, Chelsea, taking a nap on uh, some sacks of beans. Now, you can nap by yourself, or if you're lonely, you can nap with friends. <laughs> I just had to throw that one in there. That really tells a story. By the way, I haven't mentioned this yet, but you have to keep in mind, as soon as you get off the plane, you're hot. As soon as you get off the plane, you're sweating. As soon as you get off the plane, you're sticky. You don't stop being hot, being sweaty, being sticky until you get back on the plane to come home. So the whole week, you're just hot, sweaty, and sticky. And so you, you get exhausted, especially when you're soft Americans, used to being in air conditioning all the time, and you're working out in the heat all day and, and wrestling kids. Even if you're having fun, it still exhausts you. This is Sunday morning Bible class for the young people. You can see that it's not just the kids at the orphanage. It's just a bunch of kids from the local community that have come for Bible class. These are some adults in the adult class. More adults. You might recognize that's Jean Terard Elmera. In the, in the black outfit with the tie and then white guy next to him in the white outfit, here it is, is uh, that's me doing a little preaching down in uh, Tomazo, at the Tomazo Orphanage with the Tomazo, Tomazo Church. This guy's Rob Long. He's the minister from Edmond. He wasn't able to be here this morning, but he was a leader of our group, also doing a little preaching. And uh, Jean Terard, whom we have been supporting for years, translating for him. This is just some fellowship after church. It's like church anywhere. It breaks up. People stand around and visit. This is folks going home. Now, I wanted to put this one in here because you can see they're on this dirt road. They're walking. Nobody's in a car. Nobody has cars. Nobody has any kind of motorized transportation. They're walking, and off in the distance, you can just barely see it, is, is Tomazo, the town of Tomazo, where they're going. It's a couple of miles away. So just imagine having to walk a couple of miles to get here this morning, and then we're, when we're done, we're going to walk a couple of miles to get home. And you're going to do it in 90-degree heat with 100% humidity. That's, uh, that's their daily lot. Here's another picture of them leaving church on Sunday morning, heading down the road, everybody walking together, going home from, from the worship assembly. This was a, a baptism that took place after that morning's worship assembly. We drove, it took us like 45 minutes to crawl through town to a, a little spring that was on the other side of town that changed from being in the desert to being in a, like a tropical rainforest. And this place had been fixed up for the local community to enjoy. And this is where we went for the baptism. This is Jean Baptiste down in the water with Fresnel. Fresnel was the young man who wanted to obey the gospel that day. He'd been coming, worshiping with the church at Tomazo for some time, and this was the day he wanted to obey the gospel. Pray for Fresnel. This is the first day of Vacation Bible School. We went down expecting 40 to 60 kids to be in Vacation Bible School. The first day we had, it was 110, I think. So had a very good turnout from the community. This is me teaching an adult Bible class. This is Johnny. He was one of our translators. And I think we enjoyed his translating the best because he was a little more animated, especially when he translated for Christy in her class. And he, he did that and it because Christy's animated, and so he just kind of took on her animation. These are some more adults there for the, the Bible Vacation Bible School class on Monday morning. And more adults. Now, I wanted to put this one in there because I want you to know I could put people to sleep on any <laughs> continent, any country. I can put them to sleep as, oh, over there as well as here. So any language... <laughs> There's Christy teaching class, and there is, uh, Anth uh, not Anthony, this is Johnny translating for her. And you can see that board, that's, that's their chalkboard back there that Christy has her, uh, her thing taped to, her blue thing. And that's what she's putting her, her visual aids up on. So we had to take most everything we needed for the, for the, the lessons that were being taught. This is Rob teaching in a teenage class. And Jean-Baptiste translating for him. More teaching going on. Young kids another day in Bible class. 
Another group of kids. I just wanted you to see the, the little kids, the big kids, they're all there. They're coming out. They want to go to church. They want to hear the gospel, and they're being taught. Another group, and you can see all their faces are torn, turned towards whatever's going on up front. These are kids that pay attention, and they learn. Here's a lesson that was on the board. This was uh, a special kind of a lesson. Not all the kids got it, but this was some inter uh, teaching that they were introduced to about... Uh, finding things that were hidden in the Bible. This young man, now what he's got is part of a t-shirt. They thought that they would take crafts and have the kids write things on t-shirts from the lesson and then wear the t-shirt. But there were so many kids, they only had like 60 shirts. Instead of giving them the shirts, they, they cut the shirts up in pieces. And one of the lessons was about Jesus washing the apostles' feet. And so they said, well, here's just... Pretend like this is a towel that you would wash feet with, and they put parts of their lesson on that. And this young man has written the books of the New Testament on his. Mati, Mak, Lik, Jean. Trave, Roman, and on through there. They all sound funny to us, but those are the words of God. Here is, uh, this is Casey. She's here this morning. She's working with some of these little kids making bracelets. One of their crafts in VBS that went over great. On the bracelet are four beads. I think it's four beads. And they're different colors, and they taught the kids that one's for the birth of Jesus, one's for the gospel message, one's for the resurrection, and one's for going to heaven, or, or for you to preach the gospel message, something like that. But it was, it was a great lesson. You see these little kids working on their crafts. Here's Miss Debbie and the others teaching them St. Pen Ock. Uh, ten, two, two, two loaves and five fish. Yeah, five little fish and two loaves. If I say it in, in the Creole language, which is what they speak, it's, uh, it's, it's a little better. But I'm not going to do that because you probably suffered enough already. But they're teaching them the song. You got one hand. Is this one the fish hand? This is the fish. No, this is the fish hand. Your left hand is the fish hand and your right hand is the bread hand. Uh, five little loaves and two little fishes. Five little loaves, two little fishes. It's Saint Pénac du petit poisson. Saint Pénac du petit poisson. That's not right, but that's the right word. Oh, well. <laughs> And these kids are looking at me like, you don't know how to sing that song, man. Just keep on going. This, these are kids after vacation Bible school. They, they didn't want to go home. They just hung out. They just stayed there. They wanted to see what was going on here and be involved in the activities. Last day of vacation Bible school, this is the turnout we had. We expected 40 to 60, and we had a crew. It was, it was great. This is Miss Debbie helping some of these young ladies try on some dresses. Many of you were involved in making dresses, and other ladies up in Edmond have made dresses out of slip covers and pillow covers. This is her helping them try some on, and I want to run through some of these pictures here. One young lady in one of those beautiful little dresses, and she's holding her arms like this. It looks like she's mad. Debbie's actually given her uh, an energy bar. We brought several energy bars because we had to provide our own lunches, and she gave her one of those energy bars, and she said, I have to hide this because it'll be taken from me if I don't hide it. So she's hiding her energy bar under her hand and, and wearing her dress. And there's another young lady in a dress. You can't always see the smiles, but there you can. Another young smiling lady in a dress. Another one smiling in a dress. They're happy to get these. This is like Walmart coming to them. They really appreciate this. Now, she didn't look too happy, but I'm sure she was. Now this guy, of course, that's Jean Terard in the white shirt, and next to Jean Terard is Abel. Abel was Jean Terard's bodyguard. He didn't go anywhere without a bodyguard to keep him safe. And then the guy in the red shirt is Bois. Bois is the Creole word for wood. It means strong. Bois is his driver. So he's got a driver and he's got a bodyguard. He's got to travel with those everywhere he goes because he goes into some dangerous places. And this guy over on, the white guy over there, that's Harry. Harry's from Tennessee, and he works with a group, I think it's called Helping Hands. And Harry had come down with a co uh, one of his cohorts to teach an agriculture class to the Haitians so they can learn better how to raise some of their own food. These are the folks, the Haitians, in that class, learning how to raise a lot of food on a small piece of ground as Harry was teaching them that. By the way, do you see that ground? This is the way it was all over. It's like God said at the end of creation, man, i got a bunch of rocks left over. Where am I going to put them? I'll put them on Haiti. Uh, they're just rocks, huge boulders, fist size, head size. And I asked Harry, I said, Harry, you've been here several times. How far down do you have to dig before you get to actual dirt? He said about six feet. So it's rocks all over the place. And that's what they have to work with. Here are some of their families lined up because one of the deals with this agriculture class is there's going to be a meal served afterwards. 
And most folks in this part of Haiti don't get regular meals at all. And so they came, not just for the class, but for the free meal, and they're waiting for that. This is one of the meals. You can't see it, but there's a piece of chicken in there, one piece of chicken, some rice and beans, a little bit of macaroni and cheese, and then another kind of a, a pink salad. And this is, they waited for hours to get this because it had to be prepared up in the orphanage, and then we had to box it up and carry it down there. And sometimes you think it's going to take so much time, and it takes more. They didn't care. They waited. They were going to get a meal. They waited, and they, they lapped it up when they got it because that, to them, is a feast. We might take that for granted. We're going to get finished up here. We're going to go eat some big feast and have food left over, but they, they don't have it like that. This is our ladies, uh, some of them serving food to the folks who came for the class. This is us following up on that ag class. A day or two later, we're going to plant squash in this place. I wanted to tell you about this. It's a great idea. It's just a little strip of dirt about three feet wide, maybe 20 feet long, as long as you want it. This thing right here, uh, well, you can't see that when I put my finger there. I didn't bring the pointer with me. But on that little stand, that three-legged stand is a five-gallon bucket. Coming out of that five-gallon bucket is a single hose that has a Y. It splits. And in those two lines that you see on the ground, those two black lines are hoses, and there are holes in the top of that hose, so the water comes out the top. If it comes out the bottom, it doesn't water as much area, but if it comes out the top, it waters more area. And this, they can fill that five-gallon bucket with water. It'll run down those hoses, come out those holes, and irrigate this patch of ground. It's a very efficient and effective way to plant some ground. And there's us working on that, finishing that project up. This, if you can see it, in the lower, off to the... Uh, off to the right, that's a water spigot. Can you make out the water spigot? The mayor of Tomazo made a deal with Ken when he put the orphanages and says, you need to put a water source for some of the people, and this is what they put in, and this is a local hangout. It's just a water spigot that comes out of the ground, but people come down out of the hills to this spigot, and they do their laundry, they take their baths. This is great for them because they had to walk two or three more miles into town to get water before this spigot was put in. Here are some ladies doing their laundry. They're washing them in tubs, and they're spreading them out on the briar bushes and on the brambles, spreading them out on barbed wire fence, anything they can to get them to air dry. This is laundry day. This is what it looks like right outside the compound. More people gathered around that water spigot. It was just fascinating to see how many people used that place. Here's your laundry gear. You got a tub. You got a couple of old jugs that you can put water in, and I'm not sure what's in that large container, but that's what the ladies were bringing down to do their laundry. Of course, they carried it all on their heads. Most of the people who came to do their laundry were coming out of a canyon that was up above the orphanage. And Ken had never been up there. And he said, I want to go up there. You guys want to go? We said, well, yeah, we want to go. So we loaded up two pickups like this. And we drove up what they call a road up into that canyon to see where those people were coming from. This is one of the views. This is one of the really good parts of the road. And as we got up there, as far as we could go, people started coming out of the bush. They're just coming out of the desert, coming out of the bushes, and they're saying, what are all these white people doing up here? And I don't know for sure, but they think we're, we're the first white people that have been up there in decades, perhaps ever. Who knows? But had a whole bunch of them come out just to kind of stand around and see what's happening and what's going on. And here's some more of the folks who came out. You see that one little lady over there. She's got a little blue bundle in her arm. That's a brand new baby, brand new baby born out there in the bush. Here's a young water boy. He'd take that jug, go down to the spigot, and get his water. We happened to pick him up and give him a ride up when we were going up, so he got a ride. Here's one of the nicer houses that we found up there. This is a house made out of sticks and mud, and that's, that's a domicile for some of those folks. This, you can't really tell it, but uh, we were looking over kind of a canyon, and, and we had to go up this canyon to go to Grandma's house. I'll tell you about that in a second. But I wanted to put this picture in there so you can get a kind of a, a view of what it was like going up in that canyon. But on the top center, just down from the top in the center, do you see that little shiny thing, silvery gray looking thing, white thing? That's a house. Some kind of corrugated tin, metal. Somebody's gone across that canyon, gone up on the hill and, and built them a house. That is somebody's home over there. Here we are starting down the trail. We're going right up in that canyon. And we're going up in that canyon because these little girls lived up there and their grandma lived up there and they wanted to show us where their grandma lived and these girls had been to vacation bible school so their vacation bible school is going to show you our grandma's house so here we go off to grandma's house up the trail it was about a 20 minute walk from where we parked the trucks of course none of us had ever been up there before 
You can see all the rocks we're walking across. Another view of the trail as it opens up before us. This is a place where we stop to get a little shade, an outcropping of rock. And this is a picture. We're, we're standing in that shady spot looking across. And up through that opening between those two boulders is how Grandma has to go to get to her house. And her house is up there. You can see those two people standing up there. And right behind them is kind of a shapeless object. That is her house. And over to the, the right, you can see another one. This is what it looks like when you get up close. This is what Grandma lived in. This was her, her house. This is a house next to it. This is where they lived. You can see it's just it's rags, whatever they could find to, to cover up their domicile, put rocks on top to keep everything in place. Here's a picture of it inside. Very sparsely furnished, if you would call that furnishing, but these are her possessions, and this is where she kept them. Dirt floor, of course, and you can't tell it really there, but it's, it's on a slope. And if you've ever camped out on any kind of a slope, it doesn't take much of a slope, and you try to lay down, you're going to wake up in another place, and so you've got to keep climbing up. That's just... That's where she lived. This is a group of people that gathered outside Grandma's house, and Ken is in the middle of that, and he has, he's saying, I've, I've come to visit you in the name of Jesus. And we had gifts of clothing brought in plastic bags, and they were gathered around because they were, they were glad to get everything we brought them. They were in desperate need of it. These are some of the items of clothing that were brought from the Edmund Church that were given out on that day. This is part of the work that we were doing. Here we are planting trees outside the orphanage because they need more fruit trees, they need more shade trees, and so that's what we were doing. Of course, it was... Uh, uh, now, this is... Uh, I wanted to put this one in there to tell you about John. John couldn't be here today, but John's like a walking Bible. Uh, just, he's quoting Scripture all the time. It's just like you just walk up and punch a button. They'll say, let's get Leviticus here. Okay, let's get uh, James over here. And he's just quoting Scripture. All, long, like the Sermon on the Mount. Quotes the Sermon on the Mount. He's, when he was converted to Christ, he was really converted. You can see how easy the digging is. You just put your pick in and pull up a handful of rocks. It was rough work. Here are uh, some of our crew getting dirt, because when you get a hole dug in those rocks, you've got to put dirt in there, so there'll be something to plant a tree in. We're planting trees here out next to the water spigot, so there'll be shade trees for the folks. Can you see what's in about the center of that picture? Anybody see the tarantula? Yeah, right there it is. Old Harry. Uh, happened to be digging out of this hole and something moved down there. And I reached down. Ah, oh, that's a tarantula. I had big leather gloves on. I'm not Mr. Hero or anything. but Because I, I didn't want him in the hole. So I pulled him out. Of course, the girls are, oh, kill it, kill it, kill it. So I, I killed it. Marty Spider Killer. <laughs> Thought you'd be interested in seeing the tarantula. This is some work we were doing. They wanted to do some concrete work out back on the roofs of some of the buildings. And so now this guy over here holding the wheelbarrow, he's, his name was Toma. And he is a machine. That guy worked out in the heat all day long. And he worked really like, he was like a machine. He just blew me away. Little guy. We're sifting through some of this material because they wanted the finishing coat. They wanted to have the finest material they could. And so we sift out all, all the lumpy stuff to make it small. I don't remember why this picture is in here. Oh, yes, I do. You can see in the distance the little buildings. We're headed to the market. This was market day, going to the market. On the way to market, we pass Silvio's store. This is his store, and it's just as big as it looks. You open that door, and it's, it's like one of our closets. But this is a store, and inside this store, he's got shelves and all kinds of products that people can purchase. And right next to his store is his cooler. This is just a refrigerator, no electricity. But he puts his things in there that need to keep cool, and he'll buy ice in the morning, put on top of it, and it's cool as long as the ice lasts. Right next to that, he's got a little place where the people who come down out of the mountains that we were showing you a little bit ago could come and sit in the shade and enjoy a cool drink or whatever they can afford to buy. And I'm sure they get a little gospel preached to him there. Silvio's a member of the church. Here's the market. This is what it looked like. Not exactly a target, but it's where people went to buy their stuff. Here's some of the stuff they bought. Got some good corn. Fish, if, you're, if you like fresh fish, they had it right there. Get your fresh fish. Sugar cane, you want to make a cake, there's your sugar cane. Fresh vegetables, it's a healthy diet even if it's not a very large one. Here's your deli, all the stuff you'd have from a delicatessen. I put this picture in so you could see more ladies carrying stuff on their head. And people on motorcycles, this is a local biker gang. 
Uh, how many people on that motorcycle? Can you see? Three people on that bike. And they're usually like 100, 125 cc motorcycles. They're small. This was our bus. We were so glad to see this bus. It was a real bus. No air conditioning or anything, but it was a real bus with seats. We didn't have to ride in a bread truck. Truck. We're going to go to, to uh, City Soleil this day, but it was stuck in the mud. So first we had to get it out of the mud. There's the mud it was stuck in because it had rained the night before. Here we are back in Port-au-Prince, outside, see L'Eglise du Christ? This is the church at Delmas in Port-au-Prince. This is the church that collapsed during the earthquake, and 32 people were killed, the nursing students, because this church houses not only the church, they also have a school with about 500 students in attendance, and they have a nursing school beyond that. So they're doing a great work with that. And this is us right outside that building that has been rebuilt. This is a wonderful emergency break that they had for the bus. Here's one of the classrooms inside the Delmas Church where they teach the kids. They put the lessons on the board because they don't have textbooks, so they put the lessons on the board. There's Jean Terard and us at the lectern inside the worship auditorium at the church at Delmas. Here's their baptistry, all very nicely tiled. And here is their auditorium. Remember, no air conditioning. No glass in the windows. It's, it's all open so the air can flow through because it is hot and you've got to have some air to breathe. Here we are on our way to City Soleil, the poorest slum in the Western Hemisphere. And they wouldn't let us go in unless we had armed guards with us. So the policemen got on board with us, riding with us into City Soleil. Here are some of the students. Uh, and Mike is not here this morning because they, had, they got the water problem at the house. But back in 96, Mike went down and made a video. And from that video, support was gained to build this orphanage and the school at City Soleil. Mike was instrumental in getting this done. So when you see Mike, pat him on the back and tell him what a great job he did making that video because if he didn't make it, this wouldn't be here. And they've got this school started. I forget how many kids are attending there, but you can see they've got uniforms on because, once again, people like us sending money to support each one of these kids so they can have something nice and clean to wear to school. They get a meal at school. They don't get meals anywhere else, but they get a meal at school and they get an education. Only about 58% of the Haitians are literate, and these kids are going to be on top of that curve. Here's another class being taught, and when we went in, there were different groups reciting their lessons. And it's not like in our schools where you've got a classroom where you close the door. It's just open groups of kids here and here and here, and they're all reciting different lessons. Might drive us crazy, but they all knew what they were doing. Here's the young man who serves as the principal there. More of the children, they sang for us, we sang for them. Wall around the school, Harold was asking me about this because he didn't know if they had a wall, and I can't believe I didn't notice this, but I guess I was just seeing so many other things. They do have a wall around the school now to protect it. Slum around City Soleil. These are apartments, is what they call them. These are living quarters for families. And as you've seen some of the other things, these are really nice. They built these right there where the, uh, the school is, behind the school, behind the church, and people are living there, so it's a very good community outreach. And believe it or not, that's my last slide. Whew. So take a breath. Sorry to take you through that so fast. But we had like 1,000, 2,000 slides, and I kept saying, i, I got to show them this. i got to show them that. And there are a lot of things I didn't show you that I, I wish we had time to do. But suffice it to say, we're involved in a good work. We need to keep supporting Jean Terrard and uh, Hope for Haiti's Children and, and whatever else. And anything you can do towards helping the folks in Haiti, it would be well worth your time and well worth the effort. So I thank you so much for listening, for being patient. We'll, uh, let's have a word of prayer as we close out, and, and then we'll have an invitation song. Jairus will lead us in. Father, we're so grateful to you for all the blessings that you give us. Even as we sit here listening to the water come down, we thank you for your, your generosity and your mercy towards us and sparing us from the drought we've been enduring. We also ask you, Lord, to bless, uh, bless the Pickle families and the Erskines, Bless them, Father, and give them strength. Help them to bear up under this loss. I don't know what we're going to do without Carl. But, Father, we've, we've said that about many others who've passed on. And we always, through your strength and your grace and mercy, we're able to rally back and move on. And, Lord, we, we need that help now. Bless those families and bless us. Father, we also ask you to, to bless Mike and bless the Moss Hammers as they struggle against this uh, rain coming down. We pray that everything's going better with them. But, also, we pray that if there's anybody in this audience this morning who's moved to put their faith in you and believe the gospel and put your Lord, your Son on in baptism as their Lord, that they would do that this morning. Father, move those hearts if you would. Be with us this day and watch over us all. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
Let's stand and sing the invitation hymn together.